very delighted to have Linda Lascola uh, with us this evening as our second speaker. Linda is going, uh, the title of Linda's talk tonight uh, is Reaching Out to Non-Believing Clergy. And um, Linda is a colleague of uh, Daniel Dennett. She is the co-author, along with Dan, of the study Preachers Who Are Not Believers, a study that was funded by the Center for Cognitive Studies at Tufts University. Uh, Linda is a clinical social worker with years of professional experience as a qualitative researcher and psychotherapist. So please give a warm welcome to uh, Dr. Linda Lascola. Very happy to be here tonight. I was just uh, thanking Nathan there for the promotion. So let me start off by saying I'm not a doctor. <laughs> but he is, and we'll be talking about him. Oh, you can't see him. There's a ghostly figure oh, in the figure again with Can we lower the lights? Low, lower the lights for just yeah. a moment. Um, before, we, before we get to Dan, uh, I want to thank Stu and Nathan for inviting me here tonight to speak with you about the work that I've been doing for the last few years. Uh, Stu and I are old friends from the Humanist Book Club in Washington, D.C. There we go. And uh, also, I, I want to say that uh, I also had the pleasure of meeting Paul Kurtz just once, but it was in a, a very uh, wonderful setting, I think, in the sense that it was in Buffalo in his library. He took, we, were there, we were there for actually the Denna Conference last year. And uh, he took us all around his library, his really in his element. It was wonderful to see him in that way. Now, uh, I know that Dan would have liked to have been here tonight, but he's a very, very busy guy. Um, but uh, he, this is a five minute clip of him talking about both the clergy project and the clergy study. And I'm going to spend a fair amount of time tonight telling you about both and also trying to distinguish between the two because the names sound alike and they are overlapping and it gets to be kind of confusing at times. Uh, so I'll be explaining that, but I'll let uh, Dan start. Now, this is him, it's about a five minute clip. Did anybody go to the Global Atheist Conference last year in Australia? Nobody here went to Australia? Good, well then you haven't heard this clip, that's the good news about that. Uh, and in it he, he describes a little bit of the clergy project, a little bit of the clergy study. Let's see if I can get this to go now. You heard earlier from Dan Barker about the clergy project and the first graduate of the clergy project is a former Pentecostal minister named Jerry DeWitt. And he gave a wonderful talk at the Reason Rally in Washington. It's available on a website. I'll leave this up for a bit if you want to check it out. Listen to it, it's great fun. And about halfway through this, and it's all in evangelical rolling musical cadences. He's still a, he's a brilliant preacher, really. And he describes the five stages of his theology. And first, he believed that God loves everybody. But he couldn't reconcile that with the fact that God sent a lot of people to hell. So he changed his mind and decided that God saves everybody. <laughs> But that didn't seem to square well with what he thought he knew. So then he decided that God is in everybody. Now that seemed more defensible, and he clung with that for a while. And then he got the idea that God is everyone's internal dialogue. And then, as he memorably says, at this point, he was just one good book away from the fifth stage, God is a delusion. <laughs> and so now he's using his skills as a preacher to carry the word that God is a delusion. So this is the website for the clergy project. Dan Barker played a big role in getting it organized. Linda and I helped and Richard Dawkins Foundation helped by providing the technical help to set up this website. Now that it's going, yes, thank you, Richard. Thanks, Dan. 
Now that it's going, as Dan said, you have to be a preacher or a former preacher to be in this. So Richard and I are not preachers or former preachers, nor is Linda. So we're completely outside. We have no access to their discussions, their debates. They are self-governing. They do their own thing now. We've launched them and wish them all the best. And as Dan says, they have, they have now over 200 members. And every now and then, somebody in the group sends us an email about how they're doing. They're doing very well. Uh, without any advertising, they have picked up these new members, and they're being very careful about not, they're not sending out brochures or, or big blanket things to all the clergy in the world. They want the clergy to hear about them and come to them. In fact, one of their main problems now is that because it's, it's all confidential, of course, but in order to get in, you have to prove to the members that you're legit. And they don't want journalists or troublemakers trying to get into the inner sanctum of the, of the clergy project. So the vetting process is quite, is quite careful and laborious, and that's a bottleneck now. At this point, there isn't funding to provide job retraining, which is what we would love to have for them. But there is support that they provide for each other, moral support and help and advice, and it seems to be working out wonderfully. And one of their members, when we raised the possibility of trying to come up with funding for uh, retraining, for instance, sort of a safe place where people could get retrained to go out in the world, and this one uh, former uh, preacher said, if you promised free training, you'd have 10,000 members tomorrow. <laughs> so it's a really interesting problem. And one of the interesting things about it is that when we published our first study, Linda and I, when we published about, about clergy who don't believe, we expected a lot of church leaders, religious leaders, to condemn us for making a mountain out of a molehill or making the whole thing up. There was very little of that on the way. They all know. They all know it's true. There was hardly anybody who questioned the fact that this is a phenomenon. What nobody knows is how big it is. The clergy that we interviewed, that Linda interviewed, they really all think that they're the tip of the iceberg, but they don't dare ask their fellow clergy. They're like gays in the 50s without gaydar. <laughs> they don't dare raise the issue with other clergy they know whom they suspect are just as much non-believers as they are. And well, they should be careful because one of the things that came out a few weeks ago is that one member of the clergy project took a brave move and told his best friend, not, not somebody in the clergy project, but a, his best friend, a parishioner in his church, that he joined the clergy project and he didn't believe. His best friend. Next day, he lost his job. So it's serious. Thank you, Dan. Now let's see if I can get rid of this thing. How about if I just close it? Is that a possibility? Sure. Can we get the lights? Okay, thank you. So I think you gave a pretty good overview there in just a, like a couple of minutes. But I do need to correct a few things he said because he said there were over 200 members. Well, that was about a year ago. We now have 442 members. So it's, it's growing exponentially. We started with 52 members, and where did these 52 members of the clergy? Well, by the way, the clergy project is a it's a all online, it's a private, uh, confidential online uh, community for clergy who no longer believe and want to have a chance to, to talk with each other. We started with 52 members, and the reason I'm involved in this clergy project, even though I'm not a member, can't be a member is that I had a list of names of people who wanted to participate in the clergy study that Dan Dan and I are doing. And uh, Dan Barker also had a list of names of clergy he had met over the years. Does anybody, everybody know who Dan Barker is? He's the uh, head of the Freedom from Religion Foundation and also former clergy. 
So he would go around to conferences and he would meet other clergy and they would come and introduce them themselves. And with his group and the group that Dan Bennett and I had, um, we formed the first 52 members of the clergy project. And from then it has grown just the way Dan has said. Um, another thing he uh, mentioned is that there is no outplacement program where there is an outplacement program now. And we have Todd Stiefel to thank for that. He's, he's of the Stiefel Free Thought Foundation. And he donated $100,000 for an outplacement program. And that, I think the way that works is it's $2,500 per person. Uh, that amount of money is uh, given not to the member, the, not to the person in the clergy project, but to the outplacement specialist who helps them write a resume and, um, and interview. Uh, trained to interview and then look for jobs. So it's uh, not the, uh, uh, the 10,000 that, that, that Dan uh, has estimated, but we're, we're getting close to that now. Uh, also, he mentioned uh, GADAR, and uh, that's, that can be a problem, but uh, GADAR is getting better, I would say, or at least that's my uh, impression after interviewing a few more people, that uh, although clergy are often afraid to, uh, to, to bring up their lack of belief, it seems to, um, things seem to have changed exponentially. It seems to be a subject now that it is more okay to bring up. And they have ways of getting around it, just the way I think the gays have done over the, over the years. Um, People always want, ask me, uh, what are these people like, the people that you study, the people in the clergy project? By the way, we, uh, in the study we talked to um, 30 people. It's when I say the study, now I'm talking about the second study. The study Dan was referring to there was the first study. The first study was a pilot study of only five people. And the reason we did this uh, to start is that I thought it would be quite difficult to recruit non-leading clergy. It's not like you can, you know, call them up the telephone and say, hi, do you, do you not believe in God anymore? Do you remember the clergy? And I've been conducting qualitative research studies for 25 years, and I know what a difficult recruit is, and I thought this would be one. So I said, let's take it easy, let's go quite slowly. And we did, and we got five good people, five different Protestant denominations. Um, but but my, my whole purpose for doing that small study was to see what the recruiting problems were and then to take it from there. But Dan thought the material was so good that we should publish, which is why we did. And it was a huge shock to me that uh, we got the response that we did. I was terribly afraid that people would say, oh, only five people? How could we publish a study with only five people in it? But as Dan said, the response was such that we knew we'd hit a nerve. And also, as a result, we had many, many people contact us to participate in the second study, so I had no recruiting problems the second time around. In fact, there were many people that I had to turn away. Uh, we did have one slight recruiting problem. Um, we decided to also interview um, three seminary professors. Uh, not, be, not because we were looking for non-believing seminary professors, but because we wanted to get their perspective as well. Uh, because a lot of the seeds of doubt for these non-believing clergy begin uh, when they're in the seminary, so we wanted to see what these people were teaching. They were a little harder to recruit. I sent out many, many letters and had many, many people turn me down, but I kept on going. I, I uh, contacted uh, 38 people, got three participants, which is what I wanted, three participants. Now, what are, are non-believing clergy like? Well, they're like everybody sitting here. Well, maybe not here because I think we have some lifelong humanists in the crowd. Uh, but they vary tremendously. Uh, and the differences among them, the, the differences that, that we would see here in terms of just your life experience. What they have in common are the kinds of things that other occupational groups have in common. Uh, they tend to uh, be good speakers. They like to be, up, be up in front of people. They tend to be good people. They're social, uh, socially oriented. A lot of them have musical talents, but other than that, they're really very different from each other. Um, Dan mentioned how people uh, found out about the clergy project. It's still happening in the same way, it's just by word of mouth. But now, um, because we have not only the, the we have a, a public site where people can go and learn a little bit about the project and can actually. Uh, apply for membership on the site. 
And what we have found is, this is be no surprise to anyone who knows anything about how the web works, but whenever there's something on uh, in the media, let's say, for instance, a member of the clergy project came out dramatically uh, at the American Atheist Conference in 2012, and NPR happened to be on the spot. Uh, and uh, we had 100 applications for membership the day that they, that show was on NPR. And then we had another 100 applications um, the, the next month. Now, not all of this panned out. Uh, some people just, uh, they apply and then they just disappear. I have heard that there is a member of the clergy project in the room tonight. Is that true? There he is. Could you stand up for a minute, David? David was a, I just met David tonight. And in fact, he, he told me that he uh, had uh, left the clergy many years ago, was now an atheist. I said, have you heard about the clergy project? He said, as a, as a matter of fact, I'm a member of it. He's a Methodist minister for, what, 10 years? And yes. is now an outplacement specialist, which yes. is a good job for a, for a clergy person. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about where the, the project is going from here. Uh, I mentioned the outplacement program. Uh, the American Humanist Association is uh, helping members of the clergy project become humanist celebrants. There's a whole program that, that they're setting up for people to become humanist celebrants because the clergy already are celebrants and know all about those, how to celebrate those different stages of life. They're putting them on the fast track to get through. Uh, there's a documentary being done on the clergy project that some of you may know about, a couple of New York uh, docu document, what do you call it, document? documentarists are, are doing this, uh, and it should be out, I would say, in the next six months or so. Um, and there's going to be an interview on the Canadian Broadcasting Company uh, radio station. Be listening this Sunday, I'm not sure that's when it's going to be, but a couple years ago they did a, uh, a program with a member from, excuse me, not a member, a participant in the first study. His pseudonym is Adam Mann. He made that himself. And um, Dan Dennett was also on that. And that, uh, that radio program won an award for the best religiously oriented radio program in the world that year. And they've asked Adam to come back on uh, to be interviewed. Now Adam, as I said, he was in our study back in, uh, I interviewed him in 2009. And uh, he's still uh, in the clergy. He was one of the, also one of the founders of the clergy project. He practically set up the entire website. He is extremely eager to get out. He's taking advantage of the outplacement program. Uh, but is in a very difficult situation in the sense that he is a, uh, a fundamentalist minister in a southern town. And when he leaves, he really leaves everything behind. Uh, if he could move out of that town, there, he has skills that could easily find him a job, but he wants to stay there for his children, doesn't want to disrupt their life, and doesn't want to disrupt his wife's life. So it's a very difficult situation for some of these people. Um, we got a call from Camp Quest last week. You, you know what Camp Quest is? It's a science camp uh, uh, that with humanistic values, and uh, they one of the things they do is they have somebody act as if they're a fundamentalist minister uh, to show the kids what that is like and to have the kids uh, ask them questions. And they thought, wouldn't it be an interesting idea if we had a real um, fundamentalist minister uh, or a former fundamental, fundamentalist minister doing this? So it, it's very likely that there's going to be a member of the clergy project acting the part of a fundamentalist minister at Camp Press this summer. Um, I wanted to give you, just to tell you a little bit more about the clergy project and ask you if you have any questions about the clergy study or the clergy project. I have a little difficulty myself sometimes keeping them uh, separate. Um, I uh, handle the, the press contacts for the clergy project. That's my contribution. Uh, they asked me if I wanted to be on the board of directors. They asked Dan if he would like to be on the board of directors of one of the Fritchie Dawkins. And we all felt that it wouldn't be right somehow. I think in my case, it would, 
it, it almost seems a little bit unethical because some of the people who are on the clergy project I also know in a very uh, kind of intimate way from interviewing them in the clergy study. Um, I mentioned we now have 442 members. Uh, of those, uh, 328 are former clergy and 114 are active clergy. We've got a gender problem uh, we'd like to do something about, at least some people would like to make a change here. We have 87% men, 13% women, um, and 89% uh, of them are from the United States, 3% from Canada, 2% from the UK, and the rest are from uh, various other European countries. Uh, we've got mainly Baptists, Pentecostals, Catholics, and Methodists. We don't know exactly why that is. <laughs> Um, my theory is, not so much about the clergy project, but non-believing clergy in general, is that uh, it's easier to go from fundamentals to non-believing. If that's the most likely course. Uh, a lot of the people who participated in the study, for instance, uh, we wanted to get a wide variety of people. We had people who were, um, I recruited them because they were Episcopalian, or they were Presbyterian or something very liberal. Uh, but then when you get to talk with them, you find out they started out as a fundamentalist. And they may have even gone to a fundamentalist uh, seminary. And as their beliefs, their thinking started changing, they uh, took a few more master's courses, which is what most of them had to do, and switched to a more a liberal uh, denomination. And then they thought about things some more and sometimes just spending it Sunday mornings uh, reading this the same old Bible verses over and over again got to them. And they eventually just worked their way out of belief. <laughs> With the fundamentalists, it seems to be more of a matter of, um, of just not being able to, there's just so much that's difficult to believe in, uh, in, in, in fundamentalism that they, they tend to go from uh, belief to not belief. And I don't mean to say that it happens overnight. In fact, it, I've never I heard it, haven't had an instance of that. It's a very, very slow process. And in some cases, I think the process, uh, part of the reason the process is slow is because it's a process of giving up everything that they've ever believed and ever known. And it's a process of giving up uh, not just a job, uh, and not just a religion, but also a life. Um, something that happened just uh, recently, uh, we, we did the statistics once a month. And uh, we're always wanting to get more active members. We like more, those are the, the, really the people that the clergy project wants to serve. And uh, on April the 4th, we got two, oh, excuse me, uh, six new active members, these current clergy. One, a unity minister, an independent Christian church, United Methodist, United Church of Christ, <coughs> Presbyterian USA, and Lutheran. Those last four are very liberal types. Um, and why did this happen? Why are we getting all of these active ministers all at once? Can anybody guess? I mean, we don't really know, but we have a guess. Do you have a guess why this is happening? Easter. Easter. The <laughs> Easter effect, they call it. That uh, they just couldn't stand it one more time. Wow, it's a tough job. Yeah. <laughs> and in, the, uh, in some of the interviews I have done in the clergy study, uh, they talk about, uh, ministers talk among themselves about, oh no, it's Easter again, what are they have to get, the, get them out of the grave yet again, how are we going to do this? <laughs> so it's a big problem for them, and we're getting them to the clergy project because of that. Okay, I'd like to stop here, I have more to say, but I want to be sure that there are time for questions, because usually people have a few questions, and as I said, I'm so immersed in both of them, it's so much a part of my life, and why I never would have expected that uh, sometimes I'm not as clear as I'd like to be. Yes? So you're, you're missing a huge population of faculty who work at confessional colleges and universities who uh, a, a, a Westmont College or a Calvin College, they have a confessional statement that they have to sign and they may have worked there for 20, 30 years, have a mortgage and kids, but and tenure, but if they violate the confessional statement, um, then they lose their job. Yes, I'm aware of that. that and, one and, and, and that's a whole other population that's caught in this double bind mm -hmm. that's um, um, uh, uh, worth involving. Well, um, 
it's not that we want to exclude anybody. The, those people were absolutely uh, welcome to participate. It's a matter of them hearing about it and screwing up the courage to join. One of the people that I uh, interviewed in a study, who here's a guy who, who uh, surfing the internet, uh, found the clergy study, the clergy project the same night. And I said, well, how did you do that? He said, oh, I don't know. I was, I was looking for atheist clergy, I guess. And, you know, it came up. Uh, and uh, he is a United Church of Christ minister currently, uh, which is a very liberal uh, Protestant denomination. Uh, but he started out as a Baptist, and he went to a very fundamentalist, well, excuse me, he went to a uh, somewhat liberal seminary, but then uh, became a Baptist, and, um, and was actually teaching at the kind of university you're talking about. We had to sign one of these things. And he kept getting into trouble there uh, because his beliefs were a little too liberal, which isn't saying much at a place like that. <laughs> and uh, that he decided to leave then. And because he'd gone to a seminary that was liberal, he was able to move right into that, uh, right into the UCCs. And they said, you know, this happens all the time. We're not at all surprised. But we're, we're constantly getting people who start out fundamentalists and come to the UCC. I want to, we, we have plenty of time for questions. I, I want to ask a question, actually, uh, myself, Linda, if I may. Um, I wonder uh, if you, forgive me if you had addressed this earlier uh, when you were speaking, but uh, I wonder if this phenomenon um, of non-believing clergy is, is something that hasn't been with us for a long time and hasn't been something that has been haunting uh, people in the clergy for a long time. Because I remember an article that was written in 1998 in Free Inquiry magazine, and I remember finding it fascinating. It was written by a great humanist and scholar named Gerald LaRue. Some of you may know Gerald LaRue. And the um, article was called, When Clergy Commit the Sin of Silence. Mm -hmm. And the argument that he was making is that um, most clergy, they go through a seminary, and many, many, very high percentage actually come out non-believers, or at least highly skeptical. In other words, they're introduced to the best critical biblical scholarship in seminary, and much of it sticks and takes. So is this something that's been around a long time in the profession? This has been around for a long time. It's probably been around as long as gay people have been around. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and, and because we're in a period of progress right now, I think there's a, things are changing. Uh, right now uh, because of the internet and because of other uh, socially progressive movements. But it's been around a long, long time. And you're the first person who told me about the article that you mentioned. Did I? Yes. And I, I, I read it and I sent it to Dan. I said, look, this guy wrote our article without doing the research. Um, and he was, uh, I, I, would, I, I would say he was making a good, a good guess based on what he saw around him. Um, has anyone heard of a guy named Jean Meslier? Uh, he was someone who was pointed out to me. He was a French priest from centuries ago, and apparently he was a non-believer, and he wrote all about it. And uh, but and he gave somebody his writings uh, that went on to be uh, divulged until he died, because he wanted people to know, but he wasn't going to risk his his own standing uh, by letting it out when he was alive. And didn't Saint Augustine write something about uh, help thou my own belief or something? Was, was he not the one? I mean, it's been, it's, it's always been around. And actually one of the people who, who participated in developing the critical apparatus um, that, that uh, people learn about when they go to relatively liberal sem seminaries was Julius Wellhausen, who quit on the grounds that he could no longer sustain mm -hmm. the teaching. That was, in the mid, that was in the 19th century, so it's another famous case. Okay. One of the reasons uh, that I wanted to conduct this study was because of my own curiosity. And it was really very simple. I was, you know, I'm a researcher, I was curious. Um, and um, I never really, I didn't care much about religion throughout, throughout my adult life. And then I became very curious about it, and that's a whole other story. But I, I did, so I made my own personal academic study. And in the process of doing that, I learned everything that um, seminary students learn, which is enough to make an 80s out of me, as far as I was concerned. 
And, uh, and I was shocked that they could go through this education and still believe. So I wanted to find out about that. The way we framed the question was, uh, how do they manage the cognitive dissonance that they must feel having gone through seminary and learned all of this? Well, part of the very subtle thing I learned is that, uh, is that because they're already determined or dedicated to become clergy, they're hearing this material in a much different way than somebody like, somebody like I would hear. Um, as one of the people in the study said to me when I was asking about this, he said, well, you know, Linda, he said, it's, it's, this, this is more like a trade school. You've already decided what you want to be. And you go there and you just learn what you have to learn and then go on with it. So although the seeds of doubt are often planted at seminary because they go back and they remember some of the things they learn and they think about it in a different way. It doesn't necessarily just turn them all off. You'd think it would, but I think it's a different kind of mind and a different kind of uh, setting we're dealing with and a different kind of motivation. You know, I wonder if another area of bastion of non-belief may have been uh, right adjacent to us at Union Theological Seminary because uh, Paul Kurtz uh, used to tell me stories about um, uh, Sidney Hook, uh, who was very close with the Paul Tillich, one of the great theologians of the second part of the 20th century. And Paul Tillich, uh, of course, was a very serious, very uh, considered theologian in America. And um, Sidney Hook uh, said to him one time uh, at Union Theological Seminary, Tillich had given a very stirring talk, and Sidney Hook stood up, and it seems to me, uh, Sidney said to uh, Paul Tillich, well, it seems to me, Dr. Tillich, uh, when you boil everything down, uh, when you boil, you know, the essence of your talk down is that uh, you're essentially an atheist. And apparently somewhat kind of acknowledged in a roundabout way. So I thought, roundabout way, that's the key word. Right. So it's, it's always in a roundabout way. You made it clear that in the beginning there was no institutional pushback. By institutional I mean by the Catholic Church or any other powerful ecclesiastical institution. I'm surprised now that the study uh, and, uh, and the work that you are doing is becoming well known that there appears not to be any yet. Is that the case? That's pretty much the case. Um, what happens, what has happened uh, occasionally is that uh, somebody in a blog, not, not uh, in a newspaper article or in a, a, a journal article, but in a blog, were right about the clergy project in a very negative way. Um, and they're immediately, uh, it, it, it doesn't work. They immediately hear from not only members of the clergy project, but uh, many other people say you don't understand and uh, uh, that you're not giving them, you're not being fair to them. And they immediately back off because they have, they they don't have any ammunition. Uh, they're, they're, they're um, are, uh, they are afraid of us, I feel, I feel, and trying to put us down. I remember one guy saying, uh, oh, they must have a huge public relations bu budget. They're attracting so many people. And that was in his dreams, really, because we have no public relations <laughs> budget. And only attracting people because uh, they, they happen to hear about us, or because the media is so interested in us, that they give us the publicity we need. I was extremely uh, wary of the media at the beginning, because I thought, uh, when I say at the beginning, I mean right after we did the first uh, study, because I thought they would want to ridicule our people, and I didn't want to have that happen. I certainly didn't want to be any part of that happening. Um, about a week after the study came out and was getting all of this attention, uh, Dan got a call from ABC World News Tonight, and I said, well, you know, it's, it was a good study, but it's not, you know, it's not breaking news. And I wondered what they could possibly want with us. And uh, we were uh, talked with them at great length. And uh, what they wanted to do, I don't know if anybody saw it, it was like a, a seven minute uh, segment in 2010. Uh, and they interviewed two of the people in the study uh, with their voices and their appearance disguised. And it was extremely sensitive and good. And we, we were very careful with them, to, first of all, to make sure that they were going to present that in that kind of a light. And, and then to, um, to limit how they use them. Um, they, what they would have liked to have done, what all news people seem to want to do, is they want to have somebody, a non-believing clergy, 
come out on their television show, on their radio show, or in their newspaper article. And so we made it very clear to them that if we were going to uh, make our any of our people available to them, that they had to follow uh, our, our rules, which were that they would speak to them individually. There'd be no sort of a group therapy session with two or three people. And that there'd be no pressure whatsoever for them to come out on the show. And they followed that, and I think it worked out very well. Now, as a result of, um, uh, of that ABC World News thing, I became the media expert. You know, how do we handle the media? So that's how I took on this role for the clergy project of responding to media requests. And the most common request we get is somebody from, um, you know, Podunk uh, uh, affiliate uh, of a national uh, network uh, wanting to follow one of our people around. Uh, very unobtrusively, <laughs> and uh, he's laughing because he knows how difficult it would be in the form of clergy. Uh, and then at the end of the show, come out, uh, and uh, that would that would ruin people's career, and it would ruin their not just their career, it would ruin their lives. Well, I'd like to praise you, Linda, and then we should go on to another question. Or I've seen clips of some of the interviews you've done. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> hello. There he is again. What can I do? Okay, he's gone. I touched the wrong thing. <laughs> no problem. You have done a superb job of preserving the confidence of the people. I think the manner in which you have conducted those interviews has been very professional, and uh, you should be uh, praised for that. Um, I'm going to turn this back to Nathan so others. Okay, okay well, just let me say that uh, uh, along those lines, that uh, this is. Uh, I. I um, I'm a consultant to Tufts on this, and this whole project has gone through uh, Tufts University through their Institutional Review Board. And uh, of course, I have lots of experience as a, uh, a clinical social worker with confidentiality. Uh, but I have to say that the dealing with an Institutional Review Board that some of you, I think, are probably familiar with, with is, is just as difficult, if not more so, because you have to fill out a million forms. And uh, anyone who took part in the uh, study uh, had to fill out the form as well, uh, so knowing exactly what they were getting into and, and knowing what the confidentiality requirements were. Uh, has this uh, project given you any insight into uh, what we have to speculate on as non-believers that uh, the creation of the museum is you know, universally popular? Uh, I know from our research project in Michigan that some 40% of the biology teachers are creationists. Uh, we've just read in the paper recently some 40% of our fellow citizens think Jesus is coming back yeah. in the next 40 years. But as a minister is living uh, his or her life, are they asked questions about uh, the fact that 300 years of archaeology, anthropology has established there never were any Jews of any consequence in Egypt? Uh, do they worry about that? Does anybody ever want to visit Adam and Eve's grave? I mean, I mean are, are theological questions asked? Or are, from my experience, the, the ministers that I know, uh, they, they're more like psychologists. And uh, they're trying to, and the principal concern is they're not very relevant to people's lives. We read in USA Today about how pervasive religious thinking creationism is and so on. Did the ministers you're dealing with, were they struggling with the fact that, that people didn't want to hear about religion, they really wanted psychological assistance and how to deal with their children, their spouses, their friends? employers, uh, and they were worried they were irrelevant to people's lives. They didn't worry about being irrelevant. Um, a lot of the questions they were asked and a lot of what their, uh, uh, their work involved was, um, was being helpful to people, acting in the, uh, the shaman role, the social worker role. And that's the role that they uh, preferred. That's the reason why a lot of them went into it. And there was something that Philip said earlier about um, uh, having valuable lives. And uh, that's something, of course, we all strive for. But maybe clergy more than others in terms of feeling a call, whether it be from God or from within. They wanted to uh, be important in people's lives. And uh, so when they go into it, it's, for some of them, it's not so much, you know, I've got a special arrangement for the guy upstairs. It's I feel I have, I have something to offer you. And uh, they do it with the vehicle of religion, the vehicle of God. Uh, but my sense is many of the people that I speak to, the active, non-believing clergy, 
are still doing a wonderful job, and maybe, in, at least in my opinion, a better job than what they were doing, than, than when they were constantly referring to God, or thinking of, of, of framing it in terms of God. Well, that was always my thought, that we have over 500,000 uh, uh, churches and synagogues uh, in the United States, and most of them, if not the vast, that of the people that are occupying the clergy positions are themselves marvelous people, but all, and I, I, if they can only forget the wrongness of Adam and Eve and redemption and, and provide that kind of social interaction with their parishioners, but did, did religion become, you know, an aspect of their leaving? They, they still had the opportunity to interact with people <clears throat> in the systems uh, as psychologists, mm -hmm. or as you're saying, as a, as, a, as a counselor. Was it the redemption story, the original sin story, you know, what? Was there anything universal that uh, said, I just can't accept this? No, there wasn't anything universal. Uh, a lot of people, um, they really fought it over time because they wanted to keep their job. They wanted to stay in the community. They wanted to continue to do the good works. Uh, and some of them are, uh, uh, they're non-believing and they intend to stay in until retirement. Okay, and those tend to be the liberal clergy because if they can get through the liturgy on Sunday, if they can just turn off their mind and say the words and say, well, these, this, all these words mean something else, and probably the people in the pews that don't believe have it either, and, and just have the opportunity to give a, a good sermon about uh, daily life, take the Bible verse and turn it into what's going on in the world today, which I don't know the last time anyone here was in church, but that's often what happens. Uh, and it's, it's appreciated by the people in the pews. Uh, that they really relish the opportunity to be with people during the most important moments of their lives. Uh, they're there when, when people are born, they're there when people uh, are ill, uh, when people are getting married. Uh, and and they, they're good people who have a lot to offer and want to be there. At well, you know, that, that assistance, you know, the, the minister providing, they're giving people kind of a a way to approach life in Grand Rapids. <clears throat> we have a, uh, uh, a meeting uh, uh, every Sunday and about 30 people show up and I'll drive by 50 churches with a few hundred. And I'm thinking, is, if what they're learning at church is somewhat irrational and yet helpful, why is it there are thousands in churches and handfuls with us? I, I don't know, but I think, have, have you been to inside the church recently and listened to what was being said in there? Yes. Uh, because I, I, I haven't lately, but uh, in, my, in my experience, it, it, uh, they're not often talking about, you know, you, you're supposed to believe this, 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 and that. It's more be a good person, uh, and in some cases, if you don't, you're going to go to hell. Um, but uh, I don't get the sense, at least from the people I'm talking to, that they are uh, pushing uh, specific irrational beliefs. They're more uh, helping people lead good lives and doing this in the medium of religion. I, I, was, I was brought up being exposed to liberal Christianity, liberal Protestantism, and you know my grandmother watched every Sunday morning Robert Schuller's Hour of Power. Uh, and the thing that I find fascinating is there is a way to translate some of the wisdom that is embedded in the religious traditions and, 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 and scripture and verse and things like that, it can be transferred oftentimes into secular wisdom that is applied to what's going on in the world. And I wonder if that's maybe one of the ways a lot of, uh, a lot of clergy are able to, to, to deal with that cognitive dissonance. They're able to find a way to say, well, there's some functional value to the wisdom that's embedded in religious traditions, and I can find a way to impart this to the congregation. Uh, yes, I'd say that's true, but I, I'd say it's maybe even uh, not, it's, it's somewhat unconscious compared to uh, what you're saying. I think that, I think that they may even learn that in seminary. It's not something they come to on their own. They learn in seminary to do that, to make religion relevant to people's lives. Any other questions? Ralph? Uh, I'll hold my question. Thank you. No question. Okay. Any other questions? We have time. Actually... Stu? You have some experience as a psychotherapist, uh, Linda, and I was interested when you said that it's often the fundamentalists who make the complete break 
And that suggests to me the possibility that these are people whose minds work in an either or mode. It's either got to be this way or not at all. And so it's kind of ironic, uh, if that's true, uh, and you can comment on that if you wish, that's kind of speculative, I know, that there's this gradual change to a more liberal outlook in those who appear to be uh, more, perhaps, scholarly in their assessment of the issues. Yeah, no, that, that's um, a good way of looking at it, but that's not the way I would describe it. Uh, I think the, uh, the fundamentalists, uh, they go from belief to non-belief. Uh, we either go from belief to liberal belief to non-belief if they can make a switch from being a fundamentalist minister to being a liberal minister, which isn't always easy, because a lot of the fundamentalists haven't been to seminary, they didn't have to go. But if they have been to seminary, they can say, okay, this isn't working for me anymore, so I think I'll take another few courses and become an Episcopalian. <laughs> and so they do that, and that works for a while, and then they say, you know, I really don't believe this, and it's easy being an Episcopalian priest. I could continue doing this for the rest of my life, but it gets a little uncomfortable, and so they make the switch. So it's a complex individual matter, which is not surprising. Yes. Okay, thank you. And it, and it always happens in a, in a very slow way. Okay, if there's Sam. This is not about people of robes, but uh, men of other robes. I'm talking about medical profession. It's very hard as a doctor, practicing especially in Catholic hospitals and all that, to be known as an atheist. You can say goodbye and leave the profession. Is there any chance something like this will start in the scientific community, especially in medical profession, like clergy? Is there any chance uh, of that? Are you saying, uh, what, what, what are you asking? In anybody in private practice, if the doctor comes out and says he's an atheist or agnostic or whatever it is, his practice will be pretty much done with. Well, that's news to me. That's news I, I think so. I'm a medical doctor. I no, I, I believe you. I believe you. But that, that's yeah. news to me. And, and, uh, uh, in the Catholic faith, there's a concept called redemptive pain. I'm familiar with that. Exactly. And many doctors are the suffering of the patient mm -hmm. rewarded in heaven. Every doctor I've spoken to in the Catholic hospital in Grand Rapids says it's not enforced. Could be. It's not. There are other elements of Catholic faith that are pretty constricting on doctors. You know, and the Catholic Church has 14% of the hospitals in the United States. 640 of our hospitals are Catholic. There's a large body of people that are dealing with theology. Well, maybe that'll be the next movement, where the doctors will come out. And uh, I, would, I would like to see that happen. I would like to see that too, thank you. Because they have much more standing in the community, I think, than, than clergy do. They're much more, much more needed, really. Or they're perceived to be much more needed. And it's interesting because doctors being such an important part of the scientific community, one, one could guess that maybe there's a high proportion of medical doctors that actually are non-believers. So that's an interesting, interesting conundrum that they, many of them may face. And if there's no more questions, there is another question. I believe you're the gentleman that actually is a member of the clergy project, right? Mm -hmm. And I have a silly question. David Madison. That's a silly answer. Is there any truth to the rumor that Benedict the Sixteenth resigned to join the clergy project. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if he has joined it, I really can't. Look, look for someone whose nickname was Benny. <laughs> it would be a confidential matter. Like we have had some uh, and some activity on the internet from Rome. Though, so. Okay. Once again, everyone, we we have um. Do we have another question? We have we have a little bit more time. Uh, your presentation brings to mind something that I've been thinking about lately on the activist side of the humanist movement, which I, th I think is equally as important as the philosophical side, and that is, in terms of social change, I, I think my persuasion is that the most important factors in changes have been uh, 
the actions of people in the privileged group. Uh, men challenging other men to treat women as equals. Straits challenging other straits to treat gays as equals. It seems to me the, the most important uh, kind of activism we could have in the humanist movement for dealing with uh, factual errors of, of uh, religious belief are clergy who have come to understand what they have come to understand through the clergy project. So it seems to me the most obvious kind of retraining and reemployment would be to have them in the communities talking about why they change their minds. Is there is there any direction? Is there any movement in that direction? So sort of organizationally, there's some, of that, there's some of that going on right now. Uh, some uh, people in the clergy project who have come out of the closet, like Teresa McBain, who came out of the American Atheist Conference last year, and Jerry Dewitt, who Dan was talking about, who, as he put it, he came out on Facebook. He didn't really plan it that way. But he, I'm not a Facebook person, but you change your religious preference on um, it. He changed it to no religion, and his aunt Mary saw it or something and told everyone in the community. Uh, and then he then he had a picture taken with Richard Dawkins. He went to a pre thought convention, put that on Facebook, and I think he was really sort of asking <laughs> for it at that point. Uh, but um, there's an I I'll mention the idea because you reminded me of it. Uh, I met somebody at the uh, atheist conference, uh, American atheist conference in Austin a couple of weeks ago, who had this idea to adopt uh, members of the clergy. And that he felt that uh, he was in the tech industry. He, he thought there would be, probably be a lot of in, in, interest in the tech industry because he thinks a lot of them are atheists and a lot of them have money and could uh, adopt uh, a member of the clergy and could help them find work but could also support them and support them financially, which is what they need. I mean, these people need a means of support like everybody else. Uh, and they would love to get out if they could support their their families. Uh, and, they, and so his idea is to, uh, and this is all just in the thinking stages, is to find some way to adopt these people and then to have them go out and go around the country and talk. And I can say, I think, uh, with some certainty that many of them would be interested in doing that sort of thing because they are preachers <laughs> and because they now are very, although it's it's caused a lot of problems in their lives, one of the things we found in the study is that uh, they see the gains as being much greater than what they lost. The fact that they now understand life, and they not, now they're not fighting constantly to try to believe what is what seemed to them unbelievable, and they can appreciate uh, science and uh, nature uh, they want to go out and talk about that. They would love to be humanist soldiers. So many of them would love to be able to uh, start a humanist community. And uh, that's one of the things I wanted to mention, I think, so I'm glad you brought that up. And that there are humanist communities springing up. Do you, do you know of any? I mean, I, I mean, I've heard of a few. There's this guy in England, uh, Sanderson Jones. Have you heard of him? He's uh, a comedian. And he got the idea on a drive with another comedian that there should be some place for atheists to go on Sundays. And they put together this sort of show. And uh, they rented a, a, an abandoned church. And they did some advertising. And a whole bunch of people showed up. And they actually had to turn people away because there wasn't enough room for them. And they were doing it once a month. And now they're doing it once a week. And now they're supposedly exporting this idea. And I don't notice a lot of excitement in this room when I mention this, and that doesn't surprise me because uh, a lot of the response they're getting is, we atheists don't meet on Sunday mornings. It sounds too church-like for us. And I think it is too church-like for a lot of people, but for a lot of people it isn't. They're seeking that sort of thing. There's a community uh, at West Hill uh, United Church of Canada, outside of Toronto. It uh, started at it's, a, it's the Canadian's answer to the uh, United Church of Christ. They call it the United Church of Canada. Uh, it has sort of morphed 
from a Christian community to a humanist community. And part of the reason that happened was because their uh, pastor became more and more humanist and became more and more open about it to her community. Uh, so I think, I think that's remarkable that that's happened there. Uh, another thing that's happened, and this is another person in the clergy project, his name is Mike Aus, and I can say who he is because he's now out. He also came out dramatically on MSNBC about a year ago. And um, he was originally a Lutheran minister. He then um, was having difficulties with the liturgy. I uh, got tired of saying it every Sunday. Uh, he started a new church. It was, it was more liberal. With a, it was a non-denominational liberal Christian church with a couple of guys. And that worked for him for a while. And then he had difficulty with that as well. And uh, he decided that he, he had He was coming up. And he had this opportunity to do it on the MSNBC, so he did. Uh, on Palm Sunday, as I recall. And uh, he, his church didn't know this was going to happen. It wasn't the, the smartest move, necessarily, to me. Um, but amazingly, and I don't know the details of this, but amazingly, uh, his, a lot of the people in his community uh, followed him to his next gig, which is a humanist community in, in Houston. It's called the Oasis. And in the Oasis, he has people who started out in his Lutheran church, went to this non-denominational church, and now followed him to the humanist church, along with a lot of other people that he's picked up along the way. So exactly how all of this is happening, I mean, I think a deep study needs to be done on it. Uh, but I think that it is happening uh, is, uh, is very important. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mary, yeah. Yeah, look, well, this stuff has been happening in cycles over many, many years. The Unitarians are an outgrowth of the Congregationalists, which are an outgrowth of the Puritan. Mm -hmm. Adler, son of a rabbi, founded Ethical Culture Society. So this, this, there's been many of these cycles of, of people moving. The, the interesting part about it is none of them have become mass movements. Yes, and, and I'm and, hoping and that this will. In the, in the past. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking that the time is right now because of, we're living in such a scientific technological age and because, it sounds tribal, because of the internet, news travels much faster. Well, let me also make a point about certain professions. There's a lot of uh, research, for instance, that we've heard about medical practitioners. Medical practitioners have a high degree of religiosity and belief in the supernatural in than average of people of the same scientific background. Uh, and in another society, engineers, for instance, Muslim, large numbers of Muslim terrorists have, out of all proportion are engineers by background. The Muslim Brotherhood led by, in Egypt, by President Morsi, he's an engineer. Most of the people, very high fraction of them. So certain professions do attract certain kinds of people, and certain technology, it's not the rationality and the precision of engineering might not be your idea, most people's idea of what leads to people to have supernatural beliefs. But whatever it is, we've got to understand it, and as you say, more studies, to find out what the connection is between engineering and um, jihad tendencies or the medical people believing very much in spirits. It's very weird. Uh, you mentioned the, the medical profession having a high proportion of believers. It's astounding to me that here you have evolution, the central organizing I've principle been, of biology. Yeah, I've done work research. The research we did on the world opinions of, of scientists in India showed that the medical profession and engineers had the highest proportion of theists um, there. And uh, there, was a, there were differences between societies. Mathematicians in the West tend to be highly atheistic. In the East, they tend to be very, um, tend to be more religious. Amazing. Why that is beyond God. Right. That, that's, that's an interesting area where where there seems to me there could be some study, because here you have medical doctors, evolution is the central organizing principle of biology, and biology is the cornerstone of medicine. I mean, that's, you talk about cognitive dissonance. The, the, the differences between practitioners, the biologists in the West and in Asia, but people who study biology, natural science, 
are believers in evolution. Medical practitioners, however, are like engineers. They are practitioners. Yeah, but they're soaked, they're soaked with biology in medical school. Yeah, but they're yeah. not dealing with evolution. Dealing with no. evolution. No. There are some differences there. I would, I would suggest that. Right. The evidence, the, the, the curriculum is different, and the evidence of these two professions is quite clear. We, we have time for one more question, and I think it's from another physician, so we, let's hear her. <laughs> Maybe she has some insight into this. Thank you for your beautiful talk, and very nice. Um, in the eastern side of the world, uh, especially India, there are uh, professionals like the engineers and doctors and other field also. It's just books. Nothing works here, <laughs> like the rational thinking. And uh, they say uh, the doctor will, it's easy for them to practice because if the patient dies because of their mistakes, they say it's your fate. <coughs> you know, you are uh, destined to die. This person is destined to die. I don't have any control over this. And then the famous cine actor, Amida Bachchan, his Badma Shri, her highest award, he got, and he got in an accident. And he was treated by the doctors. They worked day and night to save him. What he did after he got better, he went to this temple. It's a very rich, it's a richest temple next to Vatican. He went and gave a big diamond necklace, which is worth more than hundred million dollars or something like that. He's a really rich guy. And you know, instead of thanking the doctors who worked he went to this temple and he gave all the credit to that temple. It's like that, it's an everyday life thing. Even my classmates who are practicing, when they cannot find a solution for the patient's uh, problem, they say, I don't have any, anything to do, only God can answer the question. If, we, if you have to die, it's, a, it's a, your fate. So, and the, the engineers also, they are very highly intellectual people, but they go to the, even this uh, space project, the guy who was the scientist who was working with the Agni project and so many other things, the, they the fly the rocket and everything, they go to these temples, first they do the puja and then they come and then fly the rocket. If it goes well, it's, uh, it's God's will. If it doesn't go well, <laughs> you know, it's the fate of that rocket also. So it's like that, intellectual people's mind it has the handcuff of this superstition. That's very common. I'm not surprised. Thank you very much, Linda Lascola. Please give her a round of applause.